Hello and welcome on Tafaragadamu. My guest today, Haimanot Alamu, actually was my guest way back in October of 1998. Haimanot was a great actor, stage director, and an eloquent speaker. He died this week after a short illness. And here are snippets from the interview from 16 years ago. Now entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds, that the fixed sentinels almost received the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire, and through their paley flames each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed, in high and boastful neighs, piercing the night's dull ear. And from the tents, the armorers, accomplishing the nights, with busy hammers closing rivets up, give dreadful notes of preparation. The country cocks do crow and the clocks do toll, and the third hour of drowsy morning name. Proud of their numbers and secure in soul, the confident and overlusty French do the low-rated English play at dice and chide the crippled, tardy-gated knight who, like a foul and ugly witch, doth limp so tediously away. The poor, condemned English, like sacrifices, sit patiently by their watchful fires and inly ruminates the morning's danger. And their gesture sad Investing lank, lean cheeks and war-worn coats presenteth them unto the gazing moon. So many horrid ghosts. Oh, now who will? Behold the royal captain of this ruined band. Walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry praise and glory on his head. For forth he goes and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with a modest smile and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Upon his royal face, there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him, nor doth he dedicate one jot of color unto the weary and all-watched night, but freshly looks and overbears a taint with cheerful semblance and sweet majesty, that every wretch pining and pale before, beholding him plucks comfort from his looks a largest, universal, like the sun, his liberal eye doth give to every one, thawing cold fear, that mean and gentles all behold, as may unworthiness define, a little touch of Harry in the night. When I grew up uh, and I started to see films, I would try to find anything. I could find tapes, films, and uh, the person that really inspired me uh, and pulled me to the world of Shakespeare was Lord Lawrence Olivier, who stayed my idol for the rest of my life. And uh, even when I do Shakespeare, I, I've used, I steal a little bit from his techniques. I came back, and of course, I had the very best training, I would say, in theater in the United States. Trained in the finest uh, university, in the finest theater, the Tyrone Guthrie in Minneapolis. So as soon as I finished my studies, I was so eager to come back, you know, and be on the stage in Ethiopia. Uh, so when my friends left for Hollywood, I left and came here. And uh, I was very gung-ho about what I'm going to do in Ethiopia. So I. I went over to the National Theatre to ask for a job because there weren't that many theatres, as you know. And it was not a rosy reception, was it? Oh, it was a terrible reception. I had uh, what they call a rude awakening. You know, I presented my case. I said, you know, I have a Master of Fine Arts, the only one in Ethiopia, and I'm professionally trained, and all of that. And uh, the guy just looked at me and he said, uh, we don't need you. I said, what? You don't need me? I said, what do you mean you don't need me? I mean, this is the only place I could come to. It's not like other professions where I could go somewhere else and get a job. But uh, I couldn't get a job. He said, um, you know, the people we have are enough, so no job. This at the National Theater, and this, that this is what? a shot done in America. 
ሰው የሚባል ሰባዊ ፍጥሩ ብጣችን ያደርከቶ ማልገባናለ በዘለማት ብቻ ሰውን ሰው ውሻን ውሻ አብለን አሜን ወለን መቀበል እንጂ ሰው የሚባል ረቂቅ ሰባዊ ፍጥሩ ሰው የሚባል ኤግዛፌር ተፈጥሮ ተአምር ያደርከቶ ማልገባናለ this is this is indeed a very interesting segment don't Thank you, you think you filmed this you you played this in america yeah when i was in exile in america i organized the first ethiopian theater company outside of ethiopia and uh, and uh, that's one of the plays we did uh, we did excerpts from uh, mother courage and petros and uh, we put it on videos and toured the united states and tried to kind of keep ethiopia's language and culture alive First of all I organized my own theater company and doing plays in Amharic and uh, second of all I got back into professional theater after so long and tried to catch up with some of my friends and uh, I had a very successful run I won a lot of awards so so it was uh, it was good to go back I would say theater saved my life in exile because I am a highly professionally trained actor and I owe it to my profession to do something that I think I should do if it's not, if it's not done professionally then it's very hard for me to do it during the time of the derg i left the theater and went into uh business uh, tourism business and all of this because uh the plays that were coming were just uh, you know propaganda plays and uh, i hated playing those i hated preparing those so luckily i never did a play that i did not believe in so i i thought that if i can't do it the right way professionally then I should do something else. It's it's the reality you can't always do what you like in a developing country. The opportunities are limited, the theaters are limited, uh, the pay is limited. I mean in Ethiopia uh, you don't get a you know big pay for being an actor. You being get a big pay for being a general manager. So that role has it switched where actors uh, today Dustin Hoffman makes uh, 5 million dollars a film. You know and uh, So I was able the other thing that's nice is that I was able to come back this time when I returned from exile and went directly to the university and I taught for 3 years at the university and and uh, that was uh, that was wonderful. Wh- when I came back from the states I I felt that the audience needed something to make them laugh. Everybody looked you know from you know 20 years of the derg everybody looked so grim. So I thought let me do something that's pure comedy that's universal in nature. So uh, I did a translation of uh, Twelfth Night. Its uh, title was Wazema, and it ran for two and a half years. And Quite a sold long, out yes. every day, and uh, I saw every performance for two and a half years and enjoyed it myself. So you consider uh, that a box office hit? Yes, I think so, and also you know long running in a box office hit. But somehow I was I had the best, the finest actors at the National Theatre who have worked with me. Some of them my former students, so I knew what I could get. So now they put a team together and uh, we also introduced the Muslim culture on the stage for the first time in Ethiopian history uh, showing our dare costumes and things like that and literally having Christians falling in love with uh, Muslims. Muslims and it worked very well and everybody vision. came and I was I was very this was produced in America yeah this was produced in America the role I play is the role of uh, Shumbash who's a sell out to the Italians It's talking about uh, people when they're tortured what happens to them تمر مرات وسطا كسامنت بحالا يتملسك سيت سيتنتوان تلكفا كبروان تقوششا بالوا قنا بلو اندات گمبارون مريت تكلو قسمو نوطو لجوچون ستسم موت يساماچو يحل ستزگننونا يون يون مكولاشك ستاستمامنو so you basically directed uh, and uh, had a part in this play Yes, I directed that. I was the founder of the company. I was I worked on the costumes. We didn't have too much money because we were in exile and uh, these productions maybe we spent a thousand dollars on each which is peanuts yeah. for that kind of thing because some of the costumes you see here are uh, from actual authentic Italian costumes that we borrowed from a film company. I am an actor definitely. All actors as they get old become directors and good directors are usually former actors because you would give an actor something that will work. The problem with directors who've never been actors is that they tell you to do things on the stage but they really don't know if it will work or not. So you have to do a lot of trial and error. But if it's a director then uh, he'll give you something that will work. So primarily I consider myself an actor. Oh, oh, oh. 
wonder. Believe me, sir, a real wonder. 38 caliber cheap special stainless model 60 double action revolver. Five shots, two inches, six and a half inch overall. <laughs> then he was one, resists rust, pitting and corrosion for a lifetime of use. You can slot his revolver, sir, through rain, muck, slush, salty sprays and swamps. What humid conditions that would rust out even the best blued or nickeled gun hardly touch this new Smith & Wesson 38 caliber cheap special stainless model 60. <laughs> Barrel, frame, cylinder, screw, springs, and every part in it except the wall and stock are machined from solid stainless steel. <laughs> and both it too, you're asking me, sir. You fire as fast as you can trigger with this gun. Bang, 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 shoot and run. Very what, interesting were, world. <laughs> what, what were the circumstances that led you to be oh, to, to, to act in this? In this, this is Avenger. Uh, this is fantastic because you know it's 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 like your earlier question. I went from not doing theater for some time. When I went to America, I had to. This was the professional acting I got into, and uh, it was really amazing because uh, this is uh, a story of a man who finds his wife with another man in bed in their home. Because he goes back in the middle of the day to tell her that he got a raise. Uh, fat guy there loves money. So when he finds them together, he says he's going to shoot them. So he goes to a gunsmith to buy a gun to shoot them. But That's when he comes so to you. He comes to me, and I'm trying to sell him, you know, the most expensive gun, and I'm trying. I didn't realize the guy is such a miser. And in the end, at the end of the play, he doesn't end up buying a gun. He, he buys a mouse trap because he just didn't want to leave without buying anything. And... This was uh, a wonderful thing for me because uh, I won a very prestigious award in Washington, D.C. called the Mary Goldwater Award for this character. And, um, and that award for uh, outstanding contribution to acting in the Washington, D.C. area, that led to a bigger job at the Arena Stake. So uh, I like what I'm doing right now, and uh, I'd, like, uh, I'd like the government to help me open a private theater because there are many areas in Addis Ababa that uh, there is no entertainment of any kind. You go to Shola, you go to Sadiskilo, there is nothing. So I think now, as, uh, as we go into the free market thing, I think private theater should be encouraged and subsidized. Uh, the big thing that discouraged us was, was the taxation on arts, which was 47%. And was we, we, we screamed for the last five years, and finally it's now come down to 17% which would make it uh, feasible for us to open private theaters. I am, I am getting old, but uh, um, I'm trying to get used to the, the marvelous things that come with age. Part of it is maturity, and part of it is having a more realistic outlook on the world. I have uh, one experience that uh, I relate every once in a while. Mm, a friend of mine called George Ostraska, who is a brilliant actor, and Minneapolis were doing Macbeth, and he was playing Macbeth. And uh, what happened is that uh, we didn't know that he had a heart situation. So as we were performing, and you know the audience is there, he sat on the throne, and his eyes, you know, were glazed over, and he was dead. And we didn't know as actors that he was dead. And we kept on, because this happens usually. You know, an actor may forget his lines, so you try to cover up for him and say, mm -hmm. "My lord, this, my lord, that." And you know, we we do things that uh, to cover up to give him time to catch up and, but and remember his lines. Recover. And he was not there to recover. And uh, the curtain closed. And uh, so that was one experience that I always remember from the stage. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that outlives this day and sees old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeves and show his scars. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he will remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, 
and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day until the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day!